When Northern Archaeological Consultancy embarked upon the Annadale excavations in 2002, we had no idea that the knowledge and experience that we would gain would be vital to our work on a second and even more important brickworks four years later. I certainly had no idea that it would ignite a spark of interest that would lead me to embark on an MPhil on the topic just before COVID struck. The contrast between the Annadale and Castle SB brickworks could not have been more marked. Annadale was a large works in the heart of a major urban brick making complex with an easy access to a booming market, while Castle SB was a rural works in an idyllic location with a long and difficult sea journey to its destination market. Both kilns were oddities for their time. The Castle S.B. Hoffman was one of the earliest examples of an oblong kiln in the British Isles, and the Annadale Hoffman was a circular kiln constructed 20 years later than expected. The kiln suffered very different fates, with the Annadale Hoffman, the largest of its kind built in Ireland, being demolished for schools and housing, while the Castle S.B. Hoffman was conserved to be displayed to the public as a very important part of our industrial, of our industrial heritage. The earliest reference to brick in Ireland was found in the murage taxes of medieval towns, a tax on goods coming through the curtain wall. Brick was noted as liable for tax in the murage charters of Kilkenny of 1283, Drogheda of 1296 and Yarl of 1358. It was not known whether the bricks were locally made or imported, but were obviously worth taxing. Northern sources, though later, are both documentary and physical. In 1568, Sir Brian O'Neill and Sir Henry Sidney made agreement to cause or cut so much wood for the burning of brick as shall be appointed by Sir John Beddow. This was the first reference to brick making in Ulster, but the earliest physical or archaeological evidence for brick was at Carrickfergus Castle in the mid-16th century. The castle and town were re-fortified and modernised in the 1560s and brick was used to construct the castle gun boards. At excavations carried out in the late 40s in the grounds of Joymount, two types of Tudor brick were noted by Job. Bricks in a recess in Strangford Castle may also be late 16th century. There is also evidence from Mungavlin Castle, Donegal, Castle Caulfield in Tyrone, Newton Stewart Castle in Tyrone, and Kilwater Castle in Antrim, of brick being used for ovens and fireplace linings, as well as a star shaped chimney. Mountjoy Castle brick and Carrickfergus Castle brick was slightly smaller than the statute size in England. 9 by 4 and a quarter by 2 and a half inches. In 1575, Robert Devereux, second Earl of Essex, stated, I resolved not to build, but at one place, namely at Belfast. However, due to his failure in the war against the O'Neills, he fell from grace, and because of his trial for treason and subsequent execution, the plans were never fulfilled. Some of those involved in the construction of the bonds are known. The Draper's Company had sent over George Burkett, a London bricklayer in 1614, to build the house at Moneymore, County Londonderry, at Derry, Akadoe, and Movanagher, Peter Benson, a tiler and bricklayer, was in charge of both brickmaking and mason. Literary evidence for brickmaking was much more common than the actual bricks. In 1611, the plantation commissioners reported, We came to Belfast where we found many masons, bricklayers and other labourers, a work who had taken down the ruins of the decayed castle and likewise laid the foundations of a brick house 50 feet long. The commissioners further noted that near which town the said Sir Arthur Chichester hath ready made above 1,200,000 of good brick, whereof after furnishing of the said castle, house and bond, there will be a good proportion left for the building of other tenants within the said town. The decision to use brick to construct a castle of this period in Ireland is relatively uncommon. It may be that there was no good building stone in the immediate locality, but good brick earth was plentiful. It was also safer than the alternative wood and wattle. Newry had burnt down in 1600 and Bangor in 1625, and consideration of the dangers of fire in a wooden town caused an act to be passed in Belfast in 1639, ordering brick chimneys and houses. 
A similar bylaw was passed in 1667, so obviously the earlier statute had not been entirely successful, a situation common across the British Isles in which such laws were repeatedly ignored. Consideration was given to those good citizens who had built in brick, as in several instances, instances burgage shares were granted because the lessee had built a good brick house. Carrick Fergus made it a condition for building that the house should be built in the English manner of brick and lime, well tiled or slated, with handsome lights well glazed. The earliest brick fields were located to the southwest of Belfast along the Blackstaff and what is now Sandy Row. This area was called the Brick Hills, Brick Pits and Brick Kilns. A house named Brick Hall was also in the vicinity. The earliest bricks were hand moulded, so a more plastic clay was required. Typically 25% of water content, but this estuarine clay was a finite resource. With the expansion and remodelling of Belfast, other sources were required. By the start of the 18th century, brick was extensively used in Belfast and Dublin as the demand for housing for the middle classes and minor aristocracy mushroomed in the peace and relative prosperity of the 18th century. A traveller in 1772 described the town centre of Belfast as the houses are well built with brick and slated. Unfortunately, little of Georgian Belfast survives today, though the town was considerably smaller than Dublin, containing around 18,300 people, occupying 3,100 houses in 1792. By contrast, Dublin had a population of around 180,000 in 1798. The next sources developed were the boulder clays and glacial deposits of the Lagan Valley, illustrated with the preponderance of brickworks in the Ormo area in the late 19th and early 20th century. It was only with later technological advances such as milling machines and steam or hydraulic brick presses that the older or compact marls and shales in West Belfast could be used. Bricks were heavy and bulky and difficult to transport, so the presence of the main road south across the area was a godsend, enabling bricks to be transported the short distance by cart to the town. Approximately 500 brickyards are known to have been in operation Ireland-wide from the 17th to the early 20th century, mostly concentrated in and around large urban centres and along the main water transportation routes for ease of transport to a prospective market. Massive industrialisation and urbanisation over the course of the 19th century led to a phenomenal increase in the demand for brick with which the old handmade brick processes could not cope. Increasing technological sophistication was reflected in the fact that more than 100 brick-making machines and kilns were patented between 1820 and 1850. This allowed the exploitation of deeper and harder clay and shale, which vastly increased output. The building of the railways also had a major effect on the brick industry, providing both a market during construction and a method of transporting wares quickly and relatively cheaply to more distant markets. The first edition maps of Belfast in the mid-1830s showed 10 brick fields, 4 using estuarine clay and 6 using boulder clay. This expanded to 33 by 1896. No kilns were shown in this first edition map, suggesting that clamp firing was the norm. In 1845, Belfast bricks measured 9 by 4.5 by 3 inches and weighed 8 pounds, a thousand bricks weighing 4.7 tonnes. Belfast bricks were sought after of being better quality than those produced in most provincial towns. They were clamped burnt using coal and the higher temperature achievable would have resulted in a better fired brick. In Downpatrick, Belfast bricks were 39 shillings per thousand, 70% more than in Belfast. By the 1850s, the developing railways, towns and factories of the Industrial Revolution required vast quantities of brick. As a result, especially in the more industrialised north, large mechanised factories progressively replaced the hundreds of small country brickyards producing brick by hand. The second edition map of Belfast of 1858 may show the first kiln in Belfast at John Moore's Ravenhill Patent Tile and Brickworks. Oh. <laughs> 
The growth of its industry and the massive influx of population who migrated in search of a better life led to a great expansion on the size of Belfast in the latter half of the 19th century. Belfast grew from a town of 20,000 to a city of nearly 400,000 in the century, century between 1800 and 1900. This influx was accommodated in red brick terraces built around the centre of the town. In the last third of the 19th century, the stock of houses quadrupled, with almost 50,000 being built. Friedrich Hoffmann, a Berlin master builder, and his partner Alfred Licht developed the monumental improvement in kiln design in the late 1850s. The first Hoffmann kiln was fired in Stetten in December 1859. The basic principle of the Hoffmann method was building the kiln as a series of chambers fired in a continuous sequence, with a residual heat from one being transferred to the next. It was vastly more economical on fuel than the older single firing kilns and allowed continuous production. The Hoffmann patent revolutionized brick making and lime burning industries. By 1870 there were about a thousand Hoffman kilns in existence and by 1900 there were 5,000. One of the earliest descriptions of the operation of a Hoffman kiln was that given in a paper read by Professor James Thompson on the 5th of January 1864 to the Chemical Agricultural Society of Ulster. Professor Thompson used as an example the large kiln which Mr John Moore was then constructing at the second at the second brickworks at Hayfield Park, located close to the Ormo Bridge on the south bank of the Lagan. This Hoffman the first constructed in Ireland was probably the inspiration for Robert Merlin to construct his Hoffman kiln at Castle Espy. The Castle Espy kiln was the earliest non-circular Hoffman built in the British Isles. The Castle Espy kiln was a 24-chamber octagonal Hoffman firing pressed brick stamp with the name Castle Espy. A detailed description of the kiln was given in an article in the 11th of May 1867 edition of the Downpatrick Recorder. Construction began in mid-May 1866 under the direction of Mr Charles Bagnall. The first firing of the new kiln took place on the 18th of March 1867 and the production of bricks commenced. 11,000 tonnes of stone and one and a quarter million bricks were required during the construction. The dimensions of the kiln were 236 feet long and 11 feet high. Unfortunately, Robert, the driving force behind the enterprise, died on the 26th of December 1867, less than nine months later. For the following 10 years, the works were controlled by his father Samuel and his brother-in-law John Fenton. In 1878, Samuel Merlin died and the lime works were finally put up for sale in 1879 with the death of John Fenton. The above ground part of the kiln was demolished during the making of a runway after 1966. Northern Archaeological Consultancy Limited were contracted by the Wild Fowl and Wetlands Trust in spring 2005 to oversee the archaeological mitigation of the redevelopment of Castle S.B. Cumber WWT. Our brief involved archaeological investigation, conservation and interpretation. The complex is now a Wild Fowl Centre, though the remains of the brickworks have been integrated into an industrial heritage trail. The Hoffman kiln and connecting chimney were located and exposed and we established the location and level of preservation of the other 19th century industrial buildings, exposing the outlines of the machine shop, brick making department, drying shed and Newcastle kilns, some 3000 square metres of ancillary buildings. All restoration was undertaken using contemporary stone and brick from Castle Espy, bound, bonded with lime mortar. By 1900, there were about 30 brickworks in and around Belfast. The works in the west of the city used Triassic marls, while the brickworks along the lagan used the var of the alluvial clays deposited by the lagan. The most common firing technique, which persisted until at least the early 20th century, was clamp firing. This process left only a small mound of brick and firing debris as an archaeological trace that would be quickly covered through over by natural causes and human activity. A clamp was excavated by NAC in Lurgan in 2019.
In Sandy Row, Belfast, where the city's earliest brick pits were, the remains have been completely covered by urban development. The development and use of permanent kilns provided a larger structural base to the process of brick making, with drying sheds, moulding sheds, machine shops, along with the remains of various kiln types used, but most sites have still been destroyed by redevelopment, landscaping and rebuilding. A special set of circumstances is required, such as those pertaining to the sites at Annadale and Castle Espy, for the remains of the kilns and subsidiary buildings to survive. On the 1902 third edition OS map, and an area now covered by housing, was a site of seven large brickworks running northwards from the Annadale Brick and Tile Works near the Ormo Bridge. John Moores Hoffman is illustrated in the Hay Park Works. The most southerly of these is the Annadale Brick Company Limited. Following its closure, the site was levelled and two schools built in the 1950s. In 2002, NAC was contracted to oversee the archaeological mitigation of the new housing development to be erected on the site. Brickmaking began to expand in the late 1850s with the opening of the James Carlin Brickfield. Initial working was small scale with the dried bricks being fired in clamps. However, the 1871 map showed several long rectangular structures, probably either simple updraft kilns of the Scotch type or the more complex Newcastle downdraft, similar to one later uncovered at Castle Espy. Around 1881, William Fitzpatrick took over operations. The works was called the Annadale Brickworks in the Belfast map of 1883-84 and was depicted as two long drying sheds, a small circular beehive firing kiln and seven or eight rectangular kilns. The Annadale Brick Company appeared as the lessee in 1888 and brickmaking commenced on an industrial scale. By 1890, new sheds had been erected and the circular Hoffman kiln had been constructed at the cost of £6,500, more than £3 million in today's money. The 1901-02 OS map showed the massive Annadale Hoffman kiln with a tramway around it, a butting ancillary buildings and clay pits to north and south. Prospect Brickworks with its kilns, pits and ancillary buildings was, related, was located directly to the north in the centre of an industrial landscape. The Annadale Hoffman kiln would have dominated the brickworks with a 64 metre diameter, 7 metre height and a massive central chimney standing 50 metres high. The 1900 valuation recorded output over the previous three years of 6.6 million bricks in 1897, 6.2 million bricks in 1898 and 4.75 million bricks in 1899, equating to between 18,000 and 13,000 bricks per day. The price of Annadale bricks was £1.35 per thousand. H and J Martin's Prospect Brickworks commenced production in the 1870s. By the early 1900s, a large oval Hoffman kiln, some type of transverse kiln, and ancillary buildings had been erected and produced 60,000 bricks a day in 1888. At this time, the largest in Ireland. Their price of a guinea a thousand in 1885 was half the cost of bricks in Dublin. The fortune of the Annadale Brickworks declined during the early 20th century. The brickworks were levelled after the Second World War and Annadale Grammar School was built upon the site. Upon full excavation by NAC, the, brick, the buildings to the west of the Hoffman Kiln were found to be over 3,000 square metres in area and survived to a height of over 6 metres. They comprised the machine shop, several drying floors and two Lancashire boilers connected to the kilns via a network of brick-built viral vaulted flues for the transfer of heat. Real beds running to the east from the eastern edge of this building range showed the method by which the bricks were taken to the kilns. Lying to the east of these buildings was a circular Hoffman kiln. Excavation uncovered a central octagonal chimney plinth. Lying to the east of these buildings was a circular Hoffman kiln. Excavation uncovered a central octagonal chimney plinth. 5.1 metres across, from which radiated a series of 24 regularly spaced brick-built arched flues connecting to the circular firing chamber. 
The Hoffman and Annandale had flue apertures operated by dampers in both inner and outer walls of the firing chamber. This system was devised by William Sercom in 1891 to ensure an even burn across the width of the firing chamber, though these were not present in Castle SB, being 20 years or so too early. The basis of some kilns were insulated to reduce heat loss, though this was not evident in Annadale or Castle SB. The 24 chamber Hoffman kiln was of note, as most of the kilns erected after 1870 were oblong in plan rather than circular, which suggested that space was not at a premium at Annadale, though it is likely that the construction of a giant circular kiln and huge chimney was to make a grandiose statement, overlooked as it was by the prospect works in the hill above. A new kiln was usually topped off with a stone or brick roof work platform to protect workers' coal and stoke holes. Walsh's photos of the works at Ballinafai show roofs. The Hay Park works appeared to have an integral roof on a circular kiln, while the Ava works had projecting freestanding roof over an upper story with glazed windows. By the 1950s, the Belfast industry had contracted to just four sites. The works were Parkview at Woodvale, Laganville at Stranmillis, Colin Glen, Cloney on the Springfield and the Limestone Road. Three of these Belfast works imported clay from the Colin Glen works. Compared with at least 30 works operating in 1904, this was a massive contraction. There were several causal factors. Most of the Belfast works were close together and proximity to existing housing removed expansion options. Fluctuating demand led to closure, as did a limited clay supply of the right type. To the west of Belfast, slum deposits covered most of the Triassic marls and removal would have been prohibitively expensive. Even so, in 1955, Northern Ireland produced 80 million bricks, of which 35 million were from Belfast, and 5 million more were imported into the province in that year. In the 1970s, brick making continued on the Kuiper Marls in West Belfast and at Akadoi, Kalok and Irvinstown using glacial clays. Carboniferous fire clay, shields and Loch Ness clay were worked at Coal Island. In early 2009, Drone Brick shed 95% of its workforce as a result of the collapse in the building industry. The company had stockpiled a surplus of 35 million bricks. That resulted in the closure of the last brickmaking concern in Northern Ireland, bringing to an end over 400 years of brickmaking. The 1819 Belfast map showed 10 brickfields, but by 1900 this had expanded to more than 30 major brickworks in and around the city. These produced not only the millions of commons used for general building, but also a vast array of the fancy bricks, terracotta panels and ornaments so typical of the elaborate houses of this period. The early 1900s were the heyday of the industry, which then suffered gradual decline throughout the 20th century. Belfast brick pits were redeveloped and landscaped, subsequent to abandonment. Housing was the primary reuse, but the rubbers such as the children's playground at Clara Street and an artificial lake at Musgrave Park. The Lagan Valley brickworks are now occupied by housing and schools, some of which is now being replaced. Parkview Brickworks is now a Tesco superstore. The Springfield Road works are now business parks, as is the Limestone Road Brickworks. Castle Espy is a bird sanctuary. Few archaeologists have had the opportunity of excavating even one Hoffman kiln, so we at NAC acknowledge the privilege of having worked in two. The two excavations encompass over 25 years of brickmaking and kiln technology. The differing fortunes of the two works illustrate the the two excavations encompass over 25 years of brick making and kiln technology. The differing fortunes of the two works illustrate the point that drive and ambition may not be enough for success and that proximity to market can play a major role. It is impossible to know whether Robert Merland, had he survived, could have made a success of Castle Espy. The availability of cheap brick from numerous sources closer to the major Belfast market may suggest not. Thank you very much.